Well, good morning one more time. <clears throat> this is Dr. Bryson, and this is the last lecture video for the criminology class for the fall of the year 2022. Uh, in this last video, we're going to talk about a modern uh, psychological theory that is uh, perhaps likely the most used theory uh, in probation and parole, at least, in the U.S. and Canada. And it is called the R&R theory. Um, two um, uh, researchers, Andrews and Bonta, um, developed this theory. Uh, and this is their book. It's called The Psychology of Criminal Conduct. Um, I am holding in my hand the sixth edition, which was uh, published uh, in 2017. I'm not aware of a seventh edition that has come out yet, but one of the two, and I can never remember which one it was, has passed away. So I don't know if there will be a seventh edition. Um, however, uh, this theory has been highly influential uh, because it translates well into supervision um, for um, probation and parole officers, and indeed, well, into the rehabilitative uh, theory of corrections. Now, remember, we've got retribution, we've got rehabilitation, we've got incapacitation, um, um, we have um, skiss and, and all the other theories, but this fits really well into the rehabilitation theory of as it helps us see where to focus. So it's highly clinical, um, meaning that it is very research-based. And what Andrews and Bonta did was they looked at factors that are related to whether someone who's committed a crime are more likely or less likely to commit another crime. So they came up with this risk means responsivity. Now, so these factors are related to recidivism. Recidivism means doing it again. So if uh, someone is a drug addict and they have recidivism, that means they've gone back active addiction. If they're an alcoholic and they uh, have free and they have recidivism, then that means they go back into uh, active alcoholism. If they have committed crime, and they have a um, all right, so that's recidivism. It's doing it again. Something that in the criminal justice system, we spend a lot of time trying to curb. Okay, so recidivism or preventing recidivism is what we call secondary prevention. Okay, primary prevention. Primary prevention is where we try to prevent crime in the first place. Secondary prevention is where we try to prevent recidivism from. So uh, secondary prevention, recidivism. So the r, &R theory is about secondary prevention. So let's look at the, the risk needs responsivity, these three words. Okay, so we have static risk factors. Those, that's the R, the risk of the risk needs responsibility. Static or unchangeable risk factors. These are things that cannot be changed through intervention. For sex offenders, age is one of them. Now, Andrews and Bonta didn't do the, the work on sex offenders. Um, so for general criminal recidivism, age is not one of them. But for sex offense recidivism, age is one of them. Age cannot be changed. I want to criminal history. Your previous criminal history cannot be changed. You cannot make it better. You cannot treat it and make it better. Therefore, it's static. Now, you can make it worse by committing more crimes, but you cannot make that better. You just can't. So that's a static factor, meaning that it's unchangeable in the sense that we cannot treat it and fix it. It can't be fixed. 
Okay, so dynamic risk factors are things that are changeable or things that can be fixed. We also call these criminogenic risk factors or criminogenic needs. That's the end of the R&R. &R. That's the needs of the risk needs responsibility principle. So in rehabilitation, we will address the needs, those dynamic factors, specific factors that we know that, that help us uh, rehabilitate this person. So we know that this particular factor that we can treat is related to whether they do it again. So if we fix it, then perhaps they won't commit more crimes. And then the responsivity, those are the barriers to change and the facilitators of change. Talk about responsivity factors, there are positives and negatives. There are some things that might get in the way of, for instance, antisocial personality disorder. Our attempts to rehabilitate people with um, APDO, uh, antisocial personality disorder, um, likely are met with that individual who has a APDO or being antisocial. In other words, they learn more and more that they can use to take advantage of people. Um, however, there are also some positive responsibility factors. For instance, if someone has a really strong social support, while that is a dynamic risk factor, in other words, if they have poor social support, we can fix it. If they already have really strong social support, that we actually know they're going to respond to our efforts at rehabilitation a lot better. So the key to Andrews and Bonnet is to address the needs. Now, I want you to notice on this slide at, at uh, bullet point two in parentheses, it says that these factors are uh, related to risk of recidivism are gleaned from other criminological theories. So I'm going to go through what Andrews and Bonnet call the big eight. And the first four of these are, are they call the top four, but there are eight factors that Andrews and Bonta have identified. Now, they have developed a series of inventories that probate officers can use. They, the officer completes it, not the individual. And this is it. This one is the level of service case management inventory. Uh, there's one that's called the level of service RNR. Um, so there are all sorts of inventories that have these eight in them, but other things to, to help um, uh, plan rehabilitation efforts. First one is criminal history. Criminal history is a psychological, comes from psychological theories. Um, so in psychology, we say the best predictor of future past behavior. We know that from research. So education and employment. Well, from the IQ stuff, uh, employment is related as well, but it's psychological as well because someone who doesn't work, a lot of these are psychological. Remember the psychology of criminal conduct. Um, so a lot of these are psychological. Now, the next one is family and marital. So there are items, under, several items under each one of these main categories. But if you have non-rewarding parental relationships, that means that you probably listen more to your peers that you that you know on the street. Social control theory. That is exactly social control theory. Um, but um, it also includes differential association theory that we've studied, right? The people that you hang out with the most, you're more likely to be like. Um, okay, the next one is leisure recreation. Again, we're getting the social control theory. So if you uh, participate in organized activities that are really positive, you have more friends that have pro-social rather than anti-social thinking or anti-criminal versus pro-criminal thinking. So you're less likely to commit more crimes. And yes. So some criminal acquaintances versus some criminal friends versus few anti-criminal acquaintances 
or a few that had criminal friends. So that all those in there, again, this one is exactly differential association theory. Oh, now we get to biological theory, alcohol and drug problem, which is really a biopsychological theory. Uh, because it's biological, the addiction itself does things to the brain. Uh, also, the psychology of addiction that goes along with it. And then we get back into even more um, specified psychological um, theories, pro criminal attitudes and orientations, and the antisocial pattern. The antisocial pattern is the different. So, at the very least, we have. Um, um, social control, we have biological theories, we have differential association, and quite frankly, we likely also have a uh, social disorganization theory in here when it comes to how do you use your time. Okay, with me, it could be that you don't have parents involved, so social control theory is in there a little bit as well. But that's why this theory is so popular with probation and parole because it takes some of these other theories that ring free for a lot of probation and parole officers, but it's also highly research back as far as what the risk means and responsibility factors are. Now the weakness of this theory is that it really explain why people are criminals in the first place. It only helps us determine whether someone is more likely to do it again or not and how to intervene to try to change whether they are likely to do it again or not. It informs our rehabilitation efforts, but it doesn't really inform our upfront policy efforts to try to, to engage in primary prevention, which is to prevent people from becoming criminal. It only helps us fix if they have already become criminal. So that's the biggest weakness in this theory. It's probably the most accepted one, but it doesn't really explain much of the beginnings of the origin, which is what criminology is mostly about. Stop the screen share on this one. And I'm just going to say, since this is the last lecture video, and no, you don't have to listen to this. This is not going to be on the exam, but I just wanted to say I really appreciate all of you. Um, every last one of you, I, I really want to miss um, um, my time at Homeville. Um, I'm where I need to be. I'll get move on to where I need to be. Um, as I said earlier, as, as a person of faith, it felt like God was calling me to be in this particular place. Um, so, um, um, you know, I feel like I'm where I need to be, but um, I still miss all of you. Um, and I wish the best for all of you. I know that I'm likely going to see some of your all's names at least in high positions um, one day. Uh, but anyway, I'm enjoying working with all of you. I really care about all of you. I hope you understand that. And um, I hope to be able to work with you again in some capacity or another.